Tonight on Talking Politics, the New England town meeting can be boring, confusing, combative, and it can take a really long time. But it might also be exactly what American democracy needs right now. We'll look at why in a bit. But first, in the world of Massachusetts politics, it's an article of faith that this state is exceptional with a past and present that can't be beat. Here's then Governor Charlie Baker back in 2017 after U.S. News named Massachusetts the country's best state. We have a lot of really smart people. We have a lot of great schools. Um, that has led to a whole series of terrific, what I would call, ecosystems around uh, technology and healthcare and, and finance and um, education. And you put it all together. And in this day and age, in this kind of global economy and global world we live in, it's a, it's a terrific mix. And here's now Governor Maura Healey in her inaugural speech back in January. Our nation was born here, not with a whimper, but with the spark of revolution, a hunger for something new and a demand for something better. We established the first public park, the first public library, the first lighthouse, rail, subway, first basketball game. But according to a new poll from UMass Amherst and WCVB, for many residents, all those firsts might not be enough to make them stick around. The poll found that four in 10 of us have considered moving in the last year. And it's important to note the frustration and restlessness that number suggests cuts across a host of different demographic groups. The findings come as Healy and others are pushing tax cuts aimed at making Massachusetts more desirable, but they also drive home just how much more might need to be done. Joining me to discuss are political scientist Tatish Natetta, the director of the UMass poll, and my colleague Katie Lannon, who covers the State House for GBH News. Tatish, Katie, good to see you both. Tatish, uh, that 40% number, 4 in 10 number, is pretty striking in its own right, but there are some groups in which thoughts of relocation are even more prevalent. Who jumps out? Yeah, I mean, I think the central uh, story regarding our findings is that Republicans and conservatives and Trump voters really express high levels of dissatisfaction with living here in the Commonwealth. Um, for Republicans, I believe it's almost over half of Republicans have contemplated moving uh, and six in 10 conservatives and, and Trump voters. And so it indicates that there is a incongruence likely uh, between the politics of the state um, and the politics of uh, Republican and conservative and, and Trump voters. Um, I think that's one factor, but I think there are a number of other factors which can explain it, inclu including, you know, high costs in particular. A couple groups that jumped out at me, independents, 47 percent have thought about it. Uh, people earning less than $40,000 a year, 46 percent. Also, uh, I believe 43 percent people of color and 42% people who went to grad school. So a really diverse mix of people who are discontented. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a number of factors which lead all those different demographic groups to consider leaving the Bay State. I think, you know, as I indicated previously, I think that the increase in costs uh, of living here in the Bay State um, are having uh, an impact on people's decisions regarding their future. And that's particularly true uh, of working class folks. Um, in terms of people of color, uh, the Bay State is not necessarily the most diverse state. And a number of respondents indicated uh, a belief that there's an incongruence with the culture of the Bay State um, and the lack of diversity here uh, in the Commonwealth. And so I think there are a number of factors which explain um, this increasing discontent uh, that folks are expressing. Uh, whether or not that discontent actually leads them to, to leave the state, I think is one of, going to be one of the central questions moving forward. Uh, Katie, the findings from Tatish and his colleagues come as the question of whether the state should cut taxes and how it should cut taxes is dominating the uh, state house, from what I can tell mm -hmm. from the outside. The House just rolled out their tax cut plan this week. How does it stack up to what Governor Healy proposed doing a few weeks ago? It's pretty similar, and I think both from House leadership and the governor, you hear that narrative of wanting to uh, cut across all income brackets, all kind of swaths of the population. So both have a tax credit for uh, families with dependents, whether that's children, seniors, uh, people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. There are 
um, breaks for renters, for, for seniors who need help paying property taxes. There's some more business friendly measures that have uh, including a um, the capital short-term short capital, capital gains, gains um, being cut so from twelve percent to five percent exactly, in both, if I remember there. right. Yep, and the House also added in a simplification for how some corporate taxes are calculated. The single sales factor, the estate tax, is a big component of both. Each mm -hmm. want to raise the threshold uh, where that tax kicks in. In the House's plan, it would be at two million dollars. The governor's plan has three, which is obviously higher than two. And That's, I'm going to count on my fingers to absolutely. fact check Absolutely, journalist math, right? And right, totally. the House plan has something, has a few things the governor's plan didn't, including uh, a bump up in the earned income tax credit for, for lower income households. Now, d tell me if I've got the details right here. Is it in the ta uh, House's plan or out of the House's plan, this discussion about how to refund money if the state takes in more tax revenue than it should, is that in their plan or is that a separate piece? That's in the House plan, correct. Okay. And that was the, the surprise rebates last year, um, $3 billion that went out to taxpayers. The House wants to, rather than have that be proportional based on how much you paid in taxes, have it be a, an equal amount. Um, they're casting it as a matter of fairness. And that would be redistributive, and critics have already said that that might not pass constitutional muster, right? right? Uh, so tax cuts, obviously, are one way to bring down the cost of living, which, as Tatish said, was the, the dominant concern voiced by people in this poll. But there's other ways to go at this. You can work on the cost of childcare, which I remember when my kids were in, in daycare preschool was absolutely brutal. You can work on the cost of housing, finding some way to try to bring it down or at least keep it from going up as fast as it has been. Are there any significant steps and those are other areas brewing on Beacon Hill right now? Yeah, there's a there's a major bill that aims to make childcare more affordable for families and more sustainable for the providers. Keep people in the field because they're earning very low salaries. The the math isn't working on either side of mm -hmm. that equation. Um, Governor Healy is moving to create a housing secretary, um, which seems like something that'll be in place fairly soon. Soon being relative in Beacon Hill right. terms, but there's motion there. And a lot of what we're seeing is these kind of big conceptual moves, but in terms of direct policy actions, um, we're really focused on the budget and tax relief Taxes. on Beacon Hill right now. Yeah, uh, I actually want to talk with both of you a little more about that. Tatish, when you uh, talk to all respondents in this poll, you asked them what they thought the biggest challenge was, the biggest issue was facing the state. And I want to bring up the word cloud that that created, because I'm a big word cloud fan, but also because in the, the graphic that you created, housing was so clearly above all other concerns. You see costs there, taxes, inflations, affordable, but housing just dominates everything else. Uh, for me, that raises a question. If housing is such a predominant concern, why do you think, as someone who watches the legislature, watches the governor and how they interact with each other, uh, why is tax cuts, or why are tax cuts the focus of the Beacon Hill conversation right now? Why aren't Governor Healy and the legislature just saying, we need to do everything possible as soon as possible to tackle housing production and housing costs? Yeah, I think it's a reflection in some ways of one of the, the central concerns that the governor has expressed and a number of folks in the legislature have expressed as well, which is this issue of competitiveness and the belief that there's a large swath of the public, particularly uh, wealthier folks in the state who are potentially leaving. And, and they always reference that 110,000 uh, figure um, in a sort of uh, post-COVID Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a large belief that the reason they're leaving is the sort of uh, tax issues that Massachusetts has become well known for. You know, we're known outside of the boundaries and within as tax Massachusetts. And so this is, I think, one of their, the ways in which both the governor and the legislature want to attack that issue of competitiveness to preclude people from leaving the state. But it doesn't necessarily comport with where most of the folks in the state are. They really care about housing. We also asked, what do, what do you want to tackle? What do you want the governor to tackle in her first year? And housing overwhelmingly was the, the issue. And so this seems like a, um, again, incongruence between what constituents want the governor and the legislature to attack first and what they are actually attacking. And so whether or not that's going to have electoral consequences is going to be a story going forward. Yeah, that's interesting. Katie, I know you've been working on um, this protracted project that we've been doing with various partners, trying to get voters to tell us what they're concerned about. What's your take on why housing is not 
front and center for the legislature and the governor, why it is tax cuts. Uh, I don't know if you have a similar analysis to Tatish or part ways with him at all. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one thing that needs to be considered whenever you're talking about why Beacon Hill isn't doing anything on any particular issue is that they need to get and because they try to pass most things either unanimously or overwhelmingly, there's 200 people who a have a, a say in this one way or another. So one of the things that complicates housing policy in particular is how do you address the needs of somewhere like Boston, of the you know inner suburbs of that area, with rural communities out west, with you know tourist hotspots on the mm -hmm. Cape and Islands, uh, central Massachusetts, gateway cities, all of which have different they all have housing problems, but they all kind of manifest differently, and there's different policy levers that could be pulled. So I think there is a hard way to, it's a hard time to get consensus when every district might want something a little different. Hmm. That is a good point and also a little bit disheartening because the problem seems so acute and it makes me wonder whether we'll be able to come up with solutions that uh, are adequate to its scale. Tatish, you also asked people when they said they were thinking about moving, have been thinking about it in the past year, where they were thinking about moving. And it's word cloud time again because this one was striking. Many options, but one clear winner once again and that would be the great state of Florida. Florida, of course, under Governor Ron DeSantis, has been going really hard right. Is it possible that the number of people who said they're thinking about moving to Florida suggests, among other things, that uh, politics are less important than other issues when people think about where they're gonna be able to build a life? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a number of factors which I, which influence the location that people want to move to. I think one of the factors, of course, is just weather. And a number of respondents indicated that they were looking for a warmer climate. Um, taxes are also a factor, given the fact that the state of Florida does not have income taxes. But also, I think there are a number of folks who are growing tired, at least in terms of the perceived progressiveness of the state. And they find that they are not necessarily welcome in the state as they, as they previously were. So I think a number of issues lead folks to, to think about Florida. And of course, there's a strong network of Massachusetts residents in the state of Florida. This has been a location that uh, folks have decided to retire to or, or move to uh, for decades. And so I think all those factors mix together to, to keep Florida as the number one spot for those who are contemplating to move. You know, I will say my in-laws used to live in Florida, they now live here, and when we would go down there once a winter, it was amazing the extent to which it could transform my mood and outlook on life for like a month or two. Uh, Katie, do you think the fact that so many Massachusetts residents, again, of, of all walks of life, all stripes, are considering going somewhere else, do you think that it might kickstart the legislature a bit and get them to be as deliberative as they are, as many different interests as they have to balance? you think it might make them act with a little more alacrity than we usually see? Well, I do think the, the calendar on Beacon Hill is a, a problem when it comes to any sense of urgency because right now for the next couple of months we're going to be focused mostly on the budget mm -hmm. and not other big policy items. Although those tax cuts, when we hear about them, we do hear policymakers talking about the concern of people moving away, of the state becoming less attractive to businesses. One of the questions that it's not clear there's a, a wide degree of agreement in the legislature is on who's moving away. Is it companies? Is it businesses? Is it the wealthy? Or is it people who can't afford the cost of living, who can't afford childcare, who can't have housing? We've also seen um, People like Governor Healy and Boston Mayor Michelle Wu trying to position the state as almost a counterpoint to Florida, saying, oh, it's our values that make it attractive right. here. That came up this week in the uh, discussion around medication abortion. You know, maybe people from Mass from other states might want to think about relocating to Massachusetts because mm -hmm. of the politics here, at least according to people who, you know, are in charge of setting those politics. Yeah, I remember, didn't Governor Baker, back when he was in office and Roe was reversed, didn't he suggest that we might be the beneficiaries of a shift like that? Yeah, there was, there, that's been kind of a running thread, yeah. is that, you know, Massachusetts is a welcoming place to people who, who hold the same values of those in charge of the state. And I guess that does, as the polling from UMass indicates, kind of cut both ways. Tatish, last word to you. Uh, are there questions that you want to dig into along these lines in future polls to see how this stuff is playing out? Yeah, I mean, there, there's always the questions that I want to ask that I'm not able to include in the poll. 
But I really think digging into this question of competitiveness is really an, an issue here. Like whether or not that is, there is the real exodus of, of folks from the state. Um, again, a lot of people consider leaving. You know, I've always said I, I consider leaving after one of those really bad blizzards. Yeah. Um, but is this really, are people acting on this particular viewpoint? Um, do they know of folks that have left the state? I think those are really good pieces of evidence that can indicate whether or not this this fear that is really influencing the legislature and the governor um, actually has any strong evidence in support of it. All right, Tatish, Natata, Katie, Landon, thank you both. Next up, here in New England, we are currently in peak town meeting session. That's the annual ritual, often linked to this iconic Norman Rockwell image, in which the residents of a community gather not just as neighbors, but as their own lawmakers. In Massachusetts, in towns with less than 6,000 people, anyone eligible can show up and cast a vote on the business at hand, a so-called open town meeting. Bigger towns can go that route or use what's called a representative town meeting, in which a smaller group of participants are elected beforehand. Right now, the town of Sandwich is mulling a change from open to representative, partly thanks to dwindling attendance. But in the Berkshires, the town of Lee is about to go in the opposite direction, holding an open town meeting for the first time in more than five decades. Joining me to talk about that switch is Sarah Wright, who will be moderating the Lee Town Meeting when it kicks off next month, and Susan Clark, the co-author of All Those in Favor, a book about Vermont town meetings. She's also the co-author of Slow Democracy, Rediscovering Community, Bringing Decision-Making Back Home. And she's the town meeting moderator in Middlesex, Vermont. Thank you both. here, Sarah, what made the town of Lee decide it was going to switch from the leaner and more efficient representative format to the open town meeting? Thank you for that question, Adam. And thank you so much for covering Western Mass, or as we call it, Western Mass. Um, <laughs> Happy to. Um, so there, there hasn't been an open town meeting in Lee, as you mentioned, in uh, 50 years plus. So not since 1968. We are uh, going back to the future, if you will. And I think the um, primary cause that led to open town meeting is mostly related to what's called the rest of river settlement and the whole story of uh, GE as a large employer there for many years, um, unfortunately dumping a lot of toxic waste into the Housatonic River. Um, five towns uh, a few years back negotiated what's called rest of river settlement. And that part of that settlement includes a toxic PCB dump in the town of Lee. It hasn't come yet, but um, it was. it's obviously very upsetting to all of us who live there. And um, I think that's the real reason behind going back to open town meeting. When you say that's the big reason, does that suggest that the residents of Lee as this new threat to the community looms, that they just want to have a, a sense of maximum agency and the ability to decide their own future with this thing lurking in the background? Is that what you're thinking? I think that's exactly right, Adam. When we had our annual town meeting in 2021, only the representatives could vote on the question. It was a citizen's petition at the time. It was a close vote. It was uh, it passed by two votes. When it went to the ballot a year later as a referendum, it was 65 to 390. So I think you're 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 exactly right. Okay, uh, Susan. When town meetings work well, as someone who's written about this institutions, studied them, thought about them. When they work well, what do they accomplish that other decision-making structures don't? Well, you mentioned the town meeting as a legislature, and I, I think especially for folks who aren't from New England, this is a real eye-opener because um, uh, it's very different from, you know, what we, we see across the U.S., the town hall meetings, you know, um, where uh, in these situations, we really do have extraordinary power. We vote on budgets, we amend, uh, and, uh, you know, take direct action. And so government is a we and not a they. And that changes us. It changes us as people, how we govern year in, year out, decade after decade, century after century. Um, we are better at understanding and respecting uh, the democratic process uh, and the outcomes if we play an active role. Um, so it strengthens our skills. It strengthens our trust in the process. Um, and we're also uh, just more likely to, to be better informed voters when we know we're going to be face-to-face -face like this. Uh, 
Sarah, what have skeptics of the shift that is underway in Lynn, uh, forgive me, underway in Lee, what have skeptics of the shift said about the concerns they have and how are you trying to assuage any concerns that they might have going in? Right, I, to be honest, haven't heard a lot of uh, skepticism and maybe that's just because I haven't been privy to it. I've read about it. I've I've read, I'm, I'm following what's going on in Sandwich too, where they're thinking about going in the opposite direction. And I think that the, the gist of the skepticism, such as it is, is that when, when you go from representative to open and everyone, every town meeting member can, can vote, that people may not be as prepared for town meeting as they would be otherwise if it were a representative town meeting. Those representatives in Lee covered, came from six different districts. We had, until last year, we had about 54 representatives who all did, I know, their due diligence prior to each meeting. I am quite confident that my fellow citizens, all the town meeting members who will show up on May 11th will, will show up prepared as well. But I think that there is some some doubt about that and time will tell. So tell me if I've got this right. In Lee, you are holding one or two events prior to the actual town meeting to help people get up to speed on the issues that are gonna be discussed and debated mm -hmm. there and, and voted on, right? You're trying to get people primed so that they come in mm -hmm. with a certain base of knowledge? Yes. And I think that, um, you know, again, we had our, our baby town meeting last night and we went through uh, the the warrant uh, itself, which will be signed off on in the next week or so. And so it's been out there and you can go to the town website and you can see what we're going to discuss. We have, I think, 23 warrant articles. Two of those are citizen petitions. One's about being a pollinator friendly community, my personal favorite. But you're right, as Susan said, it's mostly about, you know, in the first place, accepting the budget reports, going over uh, operating capital budgets and and so forth. And I think that the citizens of Lee have been very highly engaged over the last so many years, given the uh, controversy that I mentioned earlier. Susan, I hadn't realized until I started trying to get ready for this segment a couple of days ago, I hadn't realized the extent to which the value or lack of value of the New England town meeting is a subject of some pretty heated debate. There are people like you who see it as uh, offering a way to, to practice a better kind of politics, um, create new relationships within a community, bonds in a community that might not exist otherwise. But then it seems to me there are some people who think the virtues of the town meeting as it's been practiced in New England for a few hundred years has been overstated and also that, that it may just be an antiquated institution. I wanna quote one person. There was an article uh, I found from a journal I'd never known existed called the Journal of Public uh, Deliberation. And a historian named Michael Zuckerman from the University of Pennsylvania wrote the following at the close of his piece. The town meetings of the 18th century were part of a world we have lost. The aspiration of that world was to a unanimity that we would find suffocating. The hallmark of that world was an intolerance of divergent opinions that we would find intolerable. I'm curious, as a town meeting advocate and champion, do you think that any of the criticisms voiced by skeptics like Michael Zuckerman have some merit? Oh, it's, yeah, it's fascinating. It's a really rich uh, conversation. And I think that that's what democracy is for, is to continue these kinds of conversations. I think the biggest tension um, in terms of town meeting versus, say, a ballot um, is the tension between democratic quantity and democratic Quality. So a democratic, and, and those are two good things. We want them both and we shouldn't see it as an either or. We should try to figure out how we can have both and. Um, so and so that's sort of the definition of a, of a polarity or, or a, a, uh, <clears throat> a paradox is when two when, good things are in tension. When you talk about quantity and quality, are you referring to um, the participation level, how many residents come out, and then whether they actually participate in the conversation, whether they yell at each other or raise thoughtful points, whether they listen to their fellow citizens, is that the sort of stuff you mean? 
So with ballot voting, we tend to get more turnout. It's simpler, it's easier, it's um, more direct to cast a ballot than it is to sit in a hard chair for multiple hours. Um, so we know that. And so, um, you know, you could say that that is more accessible, um, uh, more inclusive, a uh, uh, ballot vote. Um, on the other hand, at a, at a town meeting, we are able to see and hear each other, uh, whole, you know, sort of holistically as neighbors, as whole people. It's not just, that's that guy with that bumper sticker. Yeah. It's 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 that's that's a person who has a more complex uh, you know pers perspective than than maybe I thought. So we can not only change uh, you know possibly change uh, their mind, but we might even be able to change our own mind. Um, we, you know that's one of those quality things. Um, so um, but you know we have to think about our people taking time off for democracy. You know if they have to take either take time away from their work or their family. Um, people possibly feeling you know intimidated or excluded. Um, because public speaking is, you know, it's right up there with, you know, snakes in terms of things that people are afraid of. Um, so um, how can we, this is, I think this is the question for the 21st century is how can we take the best of our uh, democratic heritage? Um, and um, I, I disagree with Zuckerman on, on some of those points, but, um, you know, the best of that heritage and also um, include what we know about inclusion um, to, to, to bring the, uh, the, the, the institution forward. Uh, Sarah Wright, you told the Berkshire Eagle that you hope that this new format, when it's implemented in May, that it bolsters civic engagement and civic health. How are you going to know if it manages to have that effect? Well, I do think uh, to Susan's point about quantity and to your question there about participation, I mean, I think, you know, the numbers will tell us something. I do also agree that the quality of the conversation and the debate, the questions, the civility that I expect to the basic decorum that I think all moderators uh, hope for and all town meeting members, you know? Um, I mean, when I look at um, the US House of Representatives occasionally, and I do, and I see now that there are people who are shouting out, hurling insults. I, I just think we, yes, of course we've lost something, but that that is not the tone that that uh, anyone wants, I don't think from a, from a fellow citizen or um, an elected official. And I do think that um, again, with declining population as we have in the Berkshires in so many of our towns where we, struggle sometimes just to get people to run for the appropriate yep. offices. Um, I think people, anyone who shows up and everyone who shows up at annual town meeting um, wants to be heard, wants yeah. to listen to their uh, fellow citizens and neighbors. All right, well, good luck as you preside over this change. I hope it goes smoothly. Sarah thank Wright you. and Susan Clark, thank you both for talking this through. That's it for tonight, but do come back next week and please tell us what you think. The email is talkingpolitics at wgbh.org. The website's gbhnews.org slash talkingpolitics. Or you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Riley Adam. For now, thank you for watching and good night. Black is...